Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert. I'm your host, Chris Johnson, Associate Publisher for BPI. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We have muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our presenters using the chat feature on your screen. Questions entered into the chat window will only be visible to myself and our presenters. After the presentation, we'll begin the Q&A portion. I will ask the presenters your questions. Before we get started, our presenters have just a quick polling question we'd like you to interact with, which is up on your screen now. If you could take just a quick second and answer that question for us, we'll get started here in just, just a moment. Okay. With that, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us again today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Mark Bishops and Mark Schofield from Paul Life Sciences. Gentlemen. Okay, welcome. This is Mark Bishop speaking. Um, the purpose of this webcast is um, highly interactive, so we would uh, very much appreciate your questions, and we'll hope to get. get most of those answered at the end of, the web, of this webcast. As part of the webcast, I would like to introduce you a few technologies and a few principles of continuous bioprocessing, but I'm going to cut it really short to provide sufficient time for answering questions. One of the enabling technologies for continuous bioprocessing is the uh, multi-column chromatography technology that Paul developed, um, and which is branded under the name Cadence by B Technology. The principle of that technology is shown in this slide. On the left hand slide, on the left hand side of this picture, you can see a traditional chromatography column which is operated in downflow. And as the feed solution is applied on the column, a chromatography material attains a sort of equilibrium with the feed solution, and that's shown in the green part of the column. At a certain point, a mass transfer zone develops, and that mass transfer zone is really material is actually adsorbed, so below the mass transfer zone, no more product is available, and therefore there's, again, equilibrium between the liquid solution and the chromatography material. Now, above the mass transfer zone and below the mass transfer zone, there is no real mm -hmm. mass transfer actually being taken place, simply because there is thermodynamic equilibrium. So in continuous bioprocessing, those zones don't add value to the overall process, and the purpose of continuous bioprocessing is to eliminate those zones. And the way we do that is by uh, focusing on the mass transfer zone and having chromatography material freshly fed into that mass transfer zone from the bottom, and the saturated material we take from the top. And since chromatography material doesn't lend itself to be pushed through a system, we keep them in a column, and that's how you get to a multi-column chromatography process as shown in the right-hand side. This illustration shows you two huge advantages of continuous chromatography, one of them being that you can do the same job with much uh, uh, less resin because we've eliminated the idle zones above and below the mass transfer zone. The second advantage is, is, uh, second advantage is shown on the right-hand side, if we only focus on the top slide that we take online and bring to the illusion, you can clearly see that that uh, column is much more saturated than in the batch process. We can saturate the chromatography media close to the static binding capacity simply because we allow product to break through because that's being captured onto the second or third column. So those two advantages give us a lot of benefits in continuous bioprocessing. The way we do that in bioSMB technology is by using a, um, a valve cassette that comprises all the valves 
to direct all the different uh, incoming liquids to various columns. That valve is designed as an integrated cassette so that, it's, uh, just so that it could be very easily translated into a single-use device. That's a single-use item containing all the valves that are required to direct all the different process solutions into different columns, connect columns to each other, and to retrieve effluents from the different columns into either products, waste, or whatever other effluent we have. For the BioSMB PD system, which is intended for process development, the system has so many valves that we can even operate up to 16 columns, which in a process development environment provides you a lot of flexibility. You can design it for all sorts of different fluid control applications, so it's not necessarily dedicated to only uh, protein A chromatography. You can do much more with it, but the uh, primary purpose today is capture chromatography. The actual design of this valve originates from a scale down of the original idea we had for the large scale manufacturing system. So with the scale down concept or the scale down approach we have in mind, we have scalability built into the system. It is a single device that comprises all the valves, so that allows us a lot more simplicity. It has so many options that it provides all the flexibility you need to run any sort of process. process. Many people wonder how you would translate a batch process to a continuous process. For that, it is important to understand that in a uh, continuous process, fundamentally, the molecule does not see any, any other uh, step or any other condition than in a batch process. Es essentially, the molecule enters into a column, binds to the chromatography media somewhere, and after that, it just simply follows that column and while it's being washed and diluted. So conceptually, all the information we need for a process design is already available in the batch process. So the way we translate a batch process to a continuous process is by mainly focusing on the uh, batch breakthrough curves, because those are actually a representation of the uh, mass transfer zone at different linear velocities. And from that, we de derive the required contact time and the uh, absolute maximum binding capacity or the static binding capacity that we can attain on the, uh, on the columns. So it just requires a three to five breakthrough curves, a few modeling exercises, and then within one week, you can run already a few uh, uh, bio SMB experiments on your process development system. Many people would normally think that programming a multi-column chromatography system would be very hard. That's why we spent a lot of time and effort into making that as easy as possible. For that purpose, we've developed a method editor, which is quite intuitive in its use. The only thing that a programmer has to do or a chromatographer has to do is simply define the different steps for one column and make a few choices, and then the uh, method editor will expand that program across all the columns that are required to run that method and across multiple cycles. So it's actually fairly easy to use. And what we have in front of us is a snapshot of the method editor. And you can see in the left bottom corner, there's the so-called so circular chronogram, which is a visualization of the process uh, as it is being programmed. So that's a live update of what you're programming. And it will help you a lot in defining um, the required number of columns and figuring out the process and finalize it. One of the strong things about the method editor is that it's very user friendly. Uh, it uh, also allows the definition of how different steps are being programmed or, and how different columns and inlet solutions are being configured. So it sort of embraces the flexibility of the system and you can tell in the method editor how you have configured your process. It really is a step-by-step -step procedure. And the beauty of it is that the process development phase or method can be directly is, is directly portable and compatible with this uh, uh, process skill system. The method editor is also a standalone piece of software that you can also install in your on your notebook or your desktop computer. So you do not necessarily have to program your method on the system or in the lab. 
the circular chronogram is one of the key um, elements of the human machine interface of the HMI on the uh, bio SMB system. The circular chronogram displays all the steps on the outer ring of the donut that is shown here. Um, and the columns are represented by the different spokes in this wheel. Unfortunately, this presentation didn't allow us to run an animation, but as you're running the process system or the PD system, these wheels or these columns actually rotate across the process, and that will immediately show you in which step each of the column is. So if this would be the live picture of your current process, then you could see that column number four is currently being eluded, and the, the inner ring of the chronogram shows you that the product is being collected from column four. Meanwhile, column six is currently being the primary load column, and the effluent of that goes into column one, which catches whatever breaks through, breaks through from column number six, and the effluent of column one goes in the flow through. The reason why we've decided to allow the BIOSMB system to carry multiple columns, more than three or four, is because if you have higher titers, the amount of load volume you can apply in the load step is normally fairly low. Nonetheless, all the blue steps that are indicated here, the non-load steps, that total volume won't change if titer increases. So therefore, the total time that we, is required for the non-load steps will remain the same, even though when titer goes up, the load step will become shorter. Therefore, the increments between different columns are going to be shorter as titer goes up, and you will find more column increments covering the non-load steps at higher titles. As you are running a multi-column chromatography system, you will collect a lot of data, not only because the BIOSMB has no, more than one UV sensor, it actually has four UV spectral photometers, it has four conductivity probes and, and two pH probes, so there's a lot of information that's being collected, but you normally also run it for a longer period of time. And rather than with batch chromatography, where you might have one or two illusion cycles in a batch, in multi-column chromatography processes, you will typically find 20 to 50 illusion cycles in a batch. To compare 20 or 50 illusion cycles is not trivial, and that's why we've decided to embrace the concept of multivariate data analysis that helps us a lot in identifying whether a process is running consistent or not. On the slide I've shown here, you can simply see an illustration of a three-column process that's been operated for multiple cycles on the left-hand side, you can see the repetitive UV illusion peak, the UV um, absorbance peaks during the illusion and the pH traces. And although the, the scales may not be very well visible, it is a very repetitive process. Nonetheless, it is not very easy to interpret. If you do a principal component analysis on these uh, uh, repetitive signals, you can see that there is only stochastic distribution of these uh, uh, different peaks. Each peak corresponds to one dot in this, in this plot. And if there's only stochastic distribution, then you're running consistent. If we would see a clear trend between different columns, then there would be a column to column uh, um, variation. Or if there would be a trend where one of the uh, columns or one of the uh, dots would actually move away as the process proceeds, then there would be a trend that would call, uh, allow us to stop the system before such problem becomes really uh, so imminent that the batch could have been rejected. So far, we've only been talking about multi-column chromatography as an enabling unit for uh, allowing continuous downstream processing. However, there are multiple continuous downstream processing technologies which, if you can combine them in a smart way, actually have a much higher added value. This slide shows you one example of that. BioSMB or any multi-column chromatography process uh, is normally designed around a certain contact time that is required to achieve the desired binding capacity. And if that, for instance, is two minutes, which is fairly common for a lot of gel-based protein A media, that means that the amount of chromatography media in the load step needs to be enough to provide two minutes contact time for the liquid. If we are able to reduce the liquid flow entering the bio-SMB system, then we can operate the same process 
at two minutes contact time with smaller columns, simply because the liquid flow rate becomes lower. As a result, the combination of a pre-concentration step, which can, be done, which can be done with an SPTFS, a single pass tangential flow filtration step, or even an ILC, an inline concentrator, in combination with the bio and b offers tremendous added value. And we've, had the, we've seen occasions where the bias and b would normally give you a three times higher specific productivity compared to the batch process. However, when compared with an ILC or SPTFS step, that would quadruple another times. So you would be operating close to 10 times higher specific productivity. And, it's, and the pre-concentration step is a relatively simple step with a huge added value if combined in a smart way. In our labs in Westboro, we've demonstrated that this combination runs consistent for very long times, as, as can be shown in the uh, graphs on the right-hand side. That lab in Westboro is now, uh, ex has been extended to offer a complete down continuous downstream processing platform, as shown in this picture. This picture is shot with a wide uh, right angle lens but the room is actually not bigger than six, six by six meters. So in 36 square meters, we've assembled a complete integrated continuous downstream process. If you run that for 24 hours, the throughput is, <coughs> sorry, we can operate typically 25 liter of uh, cell supernatant, which if we have one gram per liter, would typically give us 25 uh, or, or grams or more in a day. Scalability has always been one of our key focuses. In fact, actually, the BIOS and B PD system is a result of a scale-down exercise rather than a scale-up exercise. So the technology as such is built to be scaled. In the laboratories in Westboro, the group of Mark Schofield, who is our co-presenter here, has demonstrated that uh, a factor of 10 scale-up is easily achievable and the quality attributes of the molecule produced in a 10 times scalar process are exactly the same as we have in the original small scale process. So originally they started with a process that carried five milliliter columns and they scaled it up by a factor of 10 to 50 milliliter columns. You can see that the throughput is much higher and the quality attributes are uh, exactly the same. So in summary, I would like to conclude the presentation part of this with the uh, uh, few, I would say, bullet points. One of them is that one of the enabling technologies, the BIOS and B technology, is a very easy to use platform for establishing multi-column chromatography processes. What is not shown in this slide deck is that you can integrate multiple steps into one BIOS and B if you, if you do it in a smart way. With having so much uh, data presented to you, the ability to monitor and control your process in a consistent way are significantly better than in a batch process. So it also allows you to uh, control your product quality much better. And the last bullet point is actually quite important because if you integrate multiple continuous bioprocessing steps, in a smart way, the added value is tremendous. I just mentioned already that combining the pre-concentration through an ILC or SPTFF with a protein A capture and a bars and B, the added value is much higher than just using the bars and B as such and much higher than using the ILC as such. So smart combinations of continuous bioprocessing steps can give tremendous advances in terms of specific productivity and or processing time. With that, I would like to end the presenta presentation part and would like to skip to or step towards the um, uh, questions. So, Mark, can I give the floor to you? Yes. Yeah, so, one of the questions we have in from the audience is, um, how would we scale this further? We show some scalability with the single machine. How could we scale this further to manufacturing? Well, the, the approach we're taking is that we are building the system as we originally intended to do, which is the large scale system where we have a single cassette with the same architecture and the same valve technology that we use in the PD system that's currently being tested for large scale applications. So the large scale system will have capabilities 
way beyond what we've seen in the PD system, and we actually target a 2,000 liter bioreactor for the large scale application. So yes, the technology is scalable without having any um, inflection points in the technologies we use. So it will be a, I wouldn't say direct scale up because essentially the PD system is a scale down of the manufacturing system. Um, and with that, all the other steps will also scale up. Another aspect that we should not forget is that time becomes a choice. So we do not necessarily have to run for eight hours or five hours. We can simply run for a longer period of time. And with that, the liquid flow rate becomes smaller, lower, and therefore the scale at which all these unit operations have to run with is going to be much lower. So scale-up is definitely possible, but the um, scale-up factor that we need to envision may not necessarily be the same factor as we have in the batch process, simply because we can run over a longer period of time. But while on that matter, can I um, ask you, you to explain how the virus and activation actually works? Because I've very briefly mentioned it, but I think it is fair to make a few comments on that. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question to have. And so we have two different approaches for viral inactivation depending on the scale we want to run on. So for the PD scale, the process development scale, we, we employ a really simple approach where we take advantage of the flexibility of the BioSMB valve block. So we have some extra valves that we can take advantage of. And we use those valves to do acid and base dosing in the VI step. And here we, we really are just doing dosing. We're not doing titration. But we have some data and a, a, a rather nice DOE to show that that dosing is pretty reliable. And we can always hit our pH set points for our low pH, for our hold, and then for raising the pH up to move on to the next step. So we have that solution on the PD scale. But on the um, larger GMP scale, we have a different solution. And it's not ready for launch yet, but we're working on a solution that will probably mimic the batch process, where we pool a, full, a few elutions, and then we'll uh, carry on and do the uh, VI process on those few elutions, and we'll have a, a semi-continuous approach to VI. Okay, so thank you. We've got a very interesting questions from the audience. Um, one of them is related to the data that is being collected on the system. Can you comment on how the data is actually organized if you run multiple cycles on the BIOS and B? Uh, how, how is that um, collected, all that information, all that raw data? Okay, so the, the BIOSMB is collecting data all the time. So we just generate one large file with all that data, and it's all time stamped. And then it's very easy to sift through that data and uh, find out all the different parameters and monitor all the sensors together. Uh, do you have a more complete answer to that question, Mark? Well, um, what we normally do is, as you, is that we have different phases or different methods run consecutively. So if you uh, look at one batch, if I, if I use the BIOS and B system to uh, purify all the methods that comes from one bioreactor, um, I first equilibrate all the columns that becomes one data file, and then I process all the material from that batch, which becomes one data file. And after that, there's going to be another method to elude the remaining product from the system after all, after all the material has been loaded on the system. Um, at the end, I want to elude even the last little bit of material from the column. That becomes a different method and therefore a different result file. So I try to keep these result files uh, very well organized and every phase in the recipe or every method in the queue becomes one individual file. And that makes reporting so much easier. So that, that's how it's, um, that was all what the BIOS and B system allows you to do. Meanwhile, it does maintain some sort of data integrity simply because it does not only store the raw data, it also stores in the result folder the method as you've actually run it. So that um, should you choose to modify that method, at least you've always saved the method as you run it. So that's a um, part of data integrity that has helped us a lot since we always manipulate methods after we've used them. Uh, but this okay. protects us from those. Good. And I've got another question for you that would be a, a great one for you to field. 
and that's what process variables are used to determine the values in the principal component analysis of the Aleutian peaks? Well, the principal components uh, uh, analysis is actually a statistical approach to, to, the, to look at the raw data. So we do not manipulate the raw data. We've collected the data, and then we're going to look within that raw data for the largest source of variation. People are normally inclined to look at similarities. If I look at my left hand, left hand and my right hand, I find them quite similar, even though there are obvious differences. These differences are very easily detected by principal components simply because it projects that data set and finds an axis or a, a hypothetical axis that displays the largest source of variation. And the projection of the data on that axis is going to be my first principal component. And then it finds a second principal component, which is the second source, of, uh, the second largest source of variation orthogonal to the first one. So it really looks for variations rather than for similarities. And it doesn't require any additional parameters. The only thing you need to do is align the data in a certain way. And we have tools to do that automatically. And then you can load it in all the commercially available principal component analysis or multivariate data analysis software. And they immediately plot the principal components. So that transformation of data actually takes no more than a few minutes for us. And it helps me visualizing large data sets in a very easy way. Um, so it, it doesn't really require any process variables. And I can look at any trace, whether it is a transition in conductivity or a, tra a, a transition in pH. And it's just a matter of what am I looking for? So if I look at, if I see huge differences in principal components between different com columns, then I might actually also look at conductivity transitions because that tells me a lot about the packing density and the packing consistency between different columns. So it's not so much a matter of a guided process through process variables. It's much more a, a tool that we can use for root cause analysis, should anything behave different than you thought it would. Excellent. And I, I'll, I'll feed, uh, field one quick question just very, very quickly. And that's, the question is um, about inline diafiltration. And I'd like to just answer that very quickly. That's uh, an area of active research for us right now. And we're working hard on that solution. And we actually have a solution that we're going out to customers with for uh, beta testing, maybe even alpha testing at this point. So if that's something that you're interested in, you should uh, contact us, and uh, we can discuss that some more. So that product is currently in beta testing. That means that we can go to customers with this solution, or what, what's this? Do you have any clue yeah. on when we can present? Um, we're going to customers with that solution now, uh, but uh, it's not my project, right? So uh, it would be great to hear from anybody who's interested on that, and then I can put them in touch with the right person. OK, fantastic. I think in the interest of time, we are scheduled until uh, 5.30. Am I correct? I'm sorry, it's European time. Uh, 11.30, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yep. thank you, gentlemen. I think that uh, will close us out here, actually. And for those questions that we didn't get to, uh, the presenters will get a copy of your questions, and they'll be able to follow up with you individually afterwards. Additionally, as, uh, as attendees to this session, you'll be emailed a link uh, for when this uh, recording goes live on our website, and you'll be able to interact with the presenters there. So thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you to our audience for joining us. And as I mentioned, the recorded version of this webcast is going to be available on, for on-demand viewing on our website. And uh, a as a registered attendee, you will receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link as well as some follow-up information. So uh, this includes this installment of BPI Ask the Expert. We look forward to having you all join us on our future Ask the Expert webcast. We have a full lineup covering many aspects of bioprocessing scheduled for the uh, duration of the year. So look for those announcements in your inbox. And uh, thank you again, and have a wonderful day.